Hey everybody, welcome back to Net DevOps Live. We are in season three and episode four. Joining me today on today's episode is a longtime friend of the show, Kevin Corbin. If you followed us through previous seasons or caught any of the previous season uh, episodes that are there, Kevin's name may be familiar. He used to be an engineer here at Cisco along with myself and we actually worked on a team together. And when we started the whole Net DevOps concept and network automation, Kevin jumped into that one with both feet. Um, he, uh, he was one of the early adopters of automation inside of the Cisco SE organization. And he fell so much in love with infrastructure as code and automation that he decided to kind of go check out the world in HashiCorp. And that's what he's here to help us understand today is HashiCorp has a whole suite of tools that are being kind of used more and more across organizations. And so I asked him to come back and explain to us a little bit about kind of how they relate to the network automation world as they go through. And then, uh, and that's kind of the, the goal for today's episode. Uh, Kevin will have a chance to kind of introduce us to the suite of tools that he talks about and helps his customers use. And then like previous episodes in the season, we're gonna spend a good chunk kind of talking through those with questions and answers. So during the episode, if you've got a question, use the question panel or the question icon inside of the webinar tool and I'll capture those. And then during our question and answer session, I'll have a chance to kind of get Kevin to answer those for us as we go through. Without further ado, Kevin, take us away. Hey, thanks, Hank. It's great to be back. Uh, you know, it's funny, this journey that I've been on has been a wild ride. And uh, sometimes I feel like when I was at Cisco, I was uh, going to network folks talking about this crazy DevOps and automation stuff. And now over here at HashiCorp, I'm talking with DevOps people and I'm this crazy network guy. So uh, still trying to find my place in this uh, multi-cloud world. but. Uh, what we're gonna to do today is just kind of take you on a tour de force of the tools that we have. And then I'm gonna kind of go through it quickly getting into the Q&A session. But um, you know, as I think about it as a network engineer, like what are these tools and what are their relevancy? I'm gonna to try to frame that up for the audience about the use cases that I think a lot of network engineers are trying to tackle and hopefully provide some, some pointers and on uh, some helpful tools along the way. Uh, so without further ado, let me see, uh, get my screen sharing up here. So yeah, what we talk about at HashiCorp is this cloud operating model. And again, I'm gonna kind of frame up what we mean by the cloud operating model, but then more importantly, I'm gonna spend a good deal of time talking about the use cases that I think a lot of network engineers are trying to tackle and how this cloud operating model can benefit them. Uh, you know, when I think about Net DevOps, and as you mentioned, it's been a pleasure to, to work with you in, in various capacities over the years and watch the, the sort of Net DevOps community uh, you know, expand, I, I kind of frame it up that it, it's it's three different things, really. Uh, obviously, we want to kind of start by automating all of the things. I think that's a core DevOps principle in terms of, you know, eliminating human processes and just making a, you know, more agile and, and uh, you know, high velocity of features into the networking domain. But the networking domain itself is also sort of expanding in this network or this multi-cloud world, right? Where we traditionally only had to think about routers and switches and maybe some firewalls and load balancers. The, the network engineer of today is tasked with doing those things as well as like starting to understand some of the networking constructs in the various public cloud providers and establishing connectivity between public cloud and private cloud. And, and then finally, you know, and this is again, kind of my journey starting with automating and then looking at some of the public cloud offerings. But really what we're talking about here is this kind of age old discussion about our network engineers, do they need to become application developers? And I think everybody has kind of an opinion in that work, in that, in that discussion. Uh, you know, but for me, I think whether we're developing, you know, we're likely not going to develop the next mobile app uh, for our organization. I mean, we have teams that do that, but I think when we when we talk about scripting and writing Ansible playbooks or Terraform code or things like that, there is a lot that we can learn from the application development world that's directly applicable to uh, uh, this net DevOps and the networking engin engineering profession uh, as a whole. So just to kind of give you a little bit of background, you know, one of the, the ironic things about HashiCorp is sometimes we're a, a company that's better known for our tools and, and, and not a lot of awareness that there is in fact a, a company and an overall strategy behind that. So you can see, um, you know, over on the right here, some, some logos and some names that you're probably familiar with, Packer, Vagrant, Terraform, Vault, we're gonna kind of go through these uh, you know, pretty quickly and talk about the use cases. But at a company level, what we aim to do 
is help organizations adopt this cloud operating model that we talk about. And that cloud operating model is the mechanism by which we can help organizations deliver on you know, their digital transformation strategies. Uh, and the way that we do that is, is a very kind of simple yet aspirational statement, right? We, we aim to enable uh, folks to provision, secure and connect and run applications on any infrastructure at any time and at any scale. Uh, so it's been a wild ride coming over. I joined HashiCorp in uh, June of last year, so just under a year. And in that short amount of time, I've watched the company almost double in size. Uh, I was hired in right around the 450 to 500 mark of employees, and, and now we're well over 900, and it is impossible to keep this slide up to date. Uh, the company itself was founded in 2012 uh, by Armand and Mitchell, which are our founders. They uh, you know, sort of came from an application background and, and saw this cha the challenges that were emerging in this multi-cloud world that's the reality today and started kind of developing some of these tools out of a necessity for them to get their day jobs done and, and kind of not have to deal with some of the complexities that I think mire a lot of organizations down. And the, and the fundamental premise here is that we see our point of view is that there's this generational transition underway. And this is kind of the basis for the cloud operating model. You know, historically, customers had largely dedicated servers that they would put in a private data center. Uh, and then that kind of evolved into this private cloud notion through virtualization. And now this sort of, you know, dynamic modern data center across usually more than one public cloud. And I think that's important because early on in kind of the cloud shift, there was like this notion that we're gonna just move everything to AWS and life's gonna be perfect. Uh, but, but the reality is, is that for various reasons, we find organizations adopting, you know, AWS for some things, Azure for some things. And, and then I think it's also important to note that in this slide, it is kind of easy to say that there's like, this is sort of a journey slide and we ultimately wanna to get to this modern data center and then everything's gonna be beautiful and rainbows and unicorns. But the reality is, is that that's not the case. Core business databases, internal applications, those are likely to remain kind of on-prem in a private cloud or in an existing data center. Um, and, and then, you know, when we talk about those in terms of systems of record, then the goal is to say, okay, well now as we're developing mobile applications to engage with our users, those mobile applications may be delivered in a public cloud, but absolutely have to have connectivity back into uh, the existing data centers and the existing infrastructure. So the world that we kind of live in is just this, you know, like, you're gonna to have to deal with all of these things, the dedicated infrastructure, the private cloud, public cloud, all of the various forms of it. And as a networking engineer, our job is to kind of make all of these things connect. And the reason that we wanna make those things connect is that we want to deliver applications to the cloud with consistency. And, and that, again, that cloud in this context is the multi-cloud. It may be on-prem, it may be in the public cloud. The challenge that we see is that these tool chains that go along with it become very, very vertically integrated, right? We have a set of tools that we would use in kind of the dedicated and on-prem to run applications on bare metal, uh, connect things using physical switches. But then when we go into any of the public clouds, we find this kind of vertical stack of integration about cloud native con uh, constructs. So, you know, you can think about on-prem in the infrastructure, we talk about subnets and routers and switches. In something like AWS, we're talking about VPCs and subnets and security groups. So the challenge there is like, how do I sort of reconcile this reality of all of this explosion of tools um, making sure that I'm, you know, ultimately delivering on the goal of delivering applications faster uh, and at the same time, trying to get some sense of normalcy across some various areas of, you know, kind of the infrastructure domain. And so much like in the networking world at HashiCore or, you know, networking and kind of OSI world, we, we decompose these challenges down into layers. And the goal of each of these layers is to kind of establish a shared platform or a single control plane that in the presence of all of that heterogeneity in the various domains, we want to have kind of a common workflow for how people would, uh, you know, provision infrastructure, secure that infrastructure, 
connect you know, various components of the infrastructure as well as connecting our users to it. And then most importantly, running the applications. And so we look at it from, uh, you know, kind of this is our stack of tools. Uh, and, and again, a kind of a control plane for every layer of this cloud operating model, which expands into, you know, on-prem and the public cloud providers. But I think one thing worth noting here is that while we sort of frame it up as a stack, we very much subscribe to the Linux philosophy that says, you know, we can try to create these Uber tools that do everything for everyone uh, in any environment. But I think a lot, you know, the history has kind of taught us that that, that may not be the world that we're living in and, and may not be feasible to actually accomplish. So our philosophy is that we want to try to, you know, frame that up in these infrastructure layers. Uh, solve one of the layers very, very well in sort of a horizontal nature to say, if I'm provisioning, I'm provisioning with Terraform. If I'm securing, uh, you know, in some aspects, that's a, a vault kind of conversation. Uh, the networking piece, which I find probably the most interesting given my background is console and, and how we think about the evolution of networking from, you know, traditional layer one through layer three into this sort of brave new world of layer four through seven. And, and one other thing to point out here, you know, we, we are a, a company that, that, you know, is very proud of our open source background, but at the same time, we understand that in a lot of cases, uh, it's not a technical problem that we're really trying to solve. The, the technology is kind of the easy part of this and sort of the layer eight or organizational challenges are where, uh, uh, you know, some of the complexity really lies. And so, we, we find ourselves in a place where we, we provide our open source uh, for individuals. So anybody on this call, you can download and, and install and start playing with any of the tools that we're gonna discuss here for any of the various use cases. And then we have a, a commercial model that says, as you embrace those tools more and more, and it moves from individual contributors or individual practitioners into a small team or maybe a, a department or a couple of teams start to use the tools all the way up into our enterprise offerings where we kind of build upon the open source and and teams foundation into you know starting to talk about things like compliance and governance that we would put into our um, uh, commercial offerings. So one thing I, I want to point out early on here, because we are going to cover a lot of content and, and there's sort of like the, I know this is a very technical audience that likes to get their hands dirty. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to give a quick plug here for our learn.hashicorp.com. If any of the tools that, that we provide uh, seem interesting to you or you have a use case for them and you want to just learn more about them, get some hands on with them, I would highly recommend this as your starting point. Uh, and, and there's great, uh, you know, code examples and, and hands-on exercises that we walk uh, uh, folks through. So let's dive right in and start with Terraform. I think Terraform is kind of the easiest ones as a network engineer to get, you know, your head around because, you know, we talk about this, that sort of automate everything. Well, we, you know, as network engineers, we provide uh, infrastructure to the business and we need to ultimately provision that infrastructure and make it, uh, you know, consistent across various environments. And we want to have, uh, uh, you know, the ability to do that rapidly in an agile fashion and respond to the business demands that are coming in. And I think the ephemeral nature of infrastructure itself is changing in such a way that, you know, the manual processes, I think we can all appreciate, you know, manual human ticket driven uh, uh, workflows just don't scale to it. So when we think about Terraform, we very much think about infrastructure provisioning and we, we take that infrastructure provisioning and we spin it a little bit into this infrastructure as code domain that I know a lot of the audience is, you know, becoming familiar with and starting to explore. Obviously the benefits of infrastructure as code are that we wanna codify those, you know, not just the definition of the infrastructure, but the policy around how infrastructure should be provisioned. And in the Terraform case, we have obviously our code bits that we would version control and store in a repository, uh, uh, and then start to think about like infrastructure, uh, you know, CI CD pipelines for infrastructure. The interesting thing about Terraform is that we're decoupled in the core of it where 
Terraform Core is responsible for you know, taking that code and then ultimately doing something with it. In this case, we leverage a, 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 a ecosystem of providers that we call this is, you can think of this as a plugin or a module for, for other tool chains, but those providers then are really the interface into public cloud and private data center components. Uh, all the way up to and including services. So, you know, think you know the the modern application things like Kubernetes and and other you know sort of monitoring and and uh, management tools that you might have. We want to be able to interact with those tools in an infrastructure as code manner because you know it's unlikely that you know the the overall provisioning workflow just means configure a router or a switch. I may have to configure a switch and a router and a firewall and some VM instances and some firewall rules that go along with those VM instances. And so we decouple that and allow the providers themselves, uh, you know, folks like Cisco or Amazon or F5 to, to provide a binding for their APIs in such a way that we don't have to worry about kind of like all of the underlying technologies that we might want to provision. And instead we're focusing on the overall provisioning of a workflow. After the code is, is you know, ingested by Terraform and, and called out to the providers, then we also uh, uh, differentiate ourselves by the way of being a stateful infrastructure provisioning tool. And again, because of those interdependencies, you know, it's, it's one thing again to kind of provision the VLAN uh, uh, or provision a subnet or you know, a switch port. But then the reality is, is that there's some other downstream consumer that is going to use that as their kind of input. Uh, so we want to be able to share that state and collaborate across that state around teams. And, and really to frame it back up to the sort of the high level use cases, what are we trying to accomplish? We want multi-cloud compliance and management through infrastructure as code. And then we ultimately want to be, be able to enable this self-service infrastructure where after I've provisioned the VLAN, uh, my downstream consumers of that, you know, maybe that VM administrator can actually consume that directly in a similar workflow uh, using Terraform to actually provision the VMs as well as the, uh, the, the network infrastructure. <laughs> so just <clears throat> as I think about this, you know, in terms of framing this up for, you know, the networking folks on the call here, again, it, we're stateful and we're declarative, I think is the two kind of differentiators for us in the networking domain. There are many of these providers for, you know, what we see as the most common networking vendors out there. I've mentioned a couple of them, Cisco, F5, Palo Alto, you know, some of your IPAM systems and DNS systems like Infoblox, uh, Checkpoint, you know, and I think that's kind of the traditional, you know, automate all of the things use cases that we have there. Uh, but then again, I think with the transition to virtual network functions, you know, now what was a traditional router or a switch may actually be a VM that we ourselves need to provision on top of some sort of cloud infrastructure, either on-prem or in a public cloud. Uh, I've had a lot of discussions with customers that are starting to think about, you know, kind of DNS records as code as well, you know, and, and that going back to the days of bind, you would have, you know, like a configuration zone file. Well, we can automate that provisioning of those DNS records uh, and have kind of the infrastructure as code operational model for that, whether it's a traditional Infoblox IPAM uh, system or, or whether it's like Route 53 and AWS. Um, I'm also seeing a lot of networking engineers getting involved in sort of content delivery networks, um, you know, so Fastly or, or uh, um, you know, CloudFront or some of the other kind of CDNs there. And I think it's worth pointing out as well that like, we don't see the sort of space of infrastructure as kind of a zero sum game. Like I know a lot of the folks on the call are familiar with Ansible and starting to use Ansible in some of their workflows. Uh, we actually integrate uh, really well with Ansible. Uh, in this space, it's kind of a different tools for different folks kind of uh, you know, conversation. And we wanna make sure we're using the right tool for the right job. So moving on this up the stack to Vault. Vault is our security automation play. And, and I really think about Vault as like a, a credential router. You know, the ultimate thing that we're, you know, the first use case we want to solve is this sort of secret sprawl problem, where as we're developing playbooks or Python scripts or, or you know, the likes of that, 
it's very easy to say, well, I'm going to just kind of hard code some credentials in there for my development environment into this playbook. And I'll kind of figure it out later how I'm going to actually secure that credential and make it kind of a, a you know production grade automation. So Vault is about centralizing those secrets into Vault and then arbitrating between who you are in terms of a client. You know, so whether that's a, 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 you know, a machine executing a Python script, whether that's a human trying to find the enable password to a router, or whether that's an application itself that maybe has you know, some sort of downstream database connectivity that it needs. The traditional approach for this would be to sort of give everybody a credential to every system that they could possibly you know, need access to you know, as part of like their onboarding process. Uh, but we think that's a, a, you know, kind of a fundamentally bad approach to it. And instead, what we can do is, again, arbitrate between if you can prove to me that you have this LDAP credential or that you're running in AWS or that you have you know, some other form of identifying information, then what we can do is we can grant you access through an API driven workflow to retrieve that secret information. Uh, you know, maybe that secret is a PKI certificate that I'm putting onto a device, or maybe it's a you know backend database that I need to gain, gain information from. I don't want to have a long-lived credential for that because it just could be that I'm doing a troubleshooting exercise and I just need it for 15 minutes or something. By centralizing the the secrets and allowing them to kind of be retrieved programmatically. We can fundamentally rethink how we talk about things like password rotations or certificate rotations because you know the challenge in doing that is I have to go out and touch a whole bunch of systems with potentially different workflows and I have to kind of resolve this secrets problem uh, you know multiple times by putting them all in vault we can kind of hey secrets management is solved for us now let's go on to what we were actually trying to to do. There's a couple other uh, use cases that I think are worth noting here. One is our data encryption. So, you know, as you're, you know, interacting with sensitive data from, you know, device configurations and things like that, it's very easy to say, well, I'm going to just store it as a file on a disk or something like that, and like hopefully it's secure, right? But, you know, we really need to start being, you know, tightening up our belts when it comes to like how do we encrypt those things, and, you know, for. A lot of folks, data encryption is an intimidating thing, especially to try to implement programmatically. So, like, we want to talk about, uh, uh, you know, encrypt the, being able to provide encryption as a service. So, through this API, I can give, you know, a, a piece of unencrypted data. The API returns it to me encrypted, and, and when I'm ready for it, I can take the the encrypted data, send it back to the API, assuming I've successfully authenticated, and it's going to return it back to me uh, in the clear text. And I don't have to build that sort of hardened data encryption into my application or my scripts that I'm building. So diving kind of right into, you know, what are some of the networking use cases that I see for Vault? I think this one's a, a pretty no brainer and I've touched on it, right? We got to remove those hard coded static values from any of our scripts, playbooks, configs. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of tools out there that sort of align with one particular framework or one particular cloud provider. But again, the goal is, is that we have to make this available kind of to everybody that needs it and have kind of a centralized uh, uh, you know, place where we can audit who's accessing those and, and have some control around like how do we reason about rotating those on a, you know, whatever our organization's policies are. So, you know, take away there, don't hard code admin and Cisco one, two, three into, uh, you know, your playbooks or Python scripts anymore. Uh, PKI certificates, this is one that I gravitated to pretty early on. And Hank, I know you had a, uh, a kind of a Twitter poll going around quite uh, just, just not too long ago around like, are people really using like, you know, enterprise class certificates on their infrastructure equipment? Or are they just kind of okay with that self-signed certificate notion? And, you know, I know my initial response for that was every time I'm working with a network engineer, whether it's with a ACI controller or whether it's with an F5 device or whatever, we're sort of been okay with like, hey, there's this self-signed certificate on there and that's like good enough. And I don't think in 2020, uh, you know, personal opinion here, maybe I, I don't think that's actually good enough. I think PKI certificate ex exists for a reason. We need to treat them like any other secret and we need to get very disciplined about how we're managing them and rotating them in the same way that we think about like SSH keys for network devices. 
you know, the same problems occur there where I need to, you know, have an organization policy that says I don't want these long lived secrets living out there anymore because, you know, now we're checking them into version control and version control is sort of inherently a, you know, move forward in time and like, you know, we don't want to have somebody commit those credentials in there because it's very, very hard to sort of erase that history. Uh, so, you know, we can kind of pretend that that's not going to happen, uh, um, but it's but it does happen. And so we have to think about like, well, you know, we got to make them short lived so that if the credential is checked into version control and we'll assume that that's going to happen, the TTL of that secret is so small because we're rotating it, uh, you know, so, so frequently that when it does become compromised, the likelihood that it's kind of already expired and good for nothing is, is uh, you, you, know, uh, uh, you know, kind of the way that we're thinking about it. Um, a couple other things I'll point out here, you know, we do have this notion of a vault agent, and this is a really kind of utility function that, that goes side by side with vault. So as we're thinking about developing the Python script or, or developing a configuration file that contains these, sens these sensitive variables, how can we sort of templatize those almost like you would a, a Jinja template in, in Ansible? Um, but, but in this case, we're using uh, you know, the Go templating language, which is Jinja-like, and then backing that with this centralized store of secrets where we can render the configuration files or even render our Python scripts in such a way that we can, um, uh, you know, get those and 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 glean them into our runtime configuration. So moving forward to Vault or to Console, sorry, uh, slip there. Console is actually, you know, my favorite tool at HashiCorp uh, because of my network background. Uh, so we'll probably spend a, a little bit more time drilling into this one, you know, in my, in my talk here and in the the Q and A. Uh, but we really think about console in kind of three ways. Um, but but to start foundationally, you know, there's a couple things about console. One is it's a it's a go binary that we can put on any workload, uh, you know, whether it's running on prem or in the cloud, and it is agent based. So we put this agent on all of the servers. We sort of have an architecture diagram over here where we think we think about them in terms of servers and clients. Servers are responsible for maintaining a strongly consistent database of the information that console stores and cares about. And then clients are responsible for registering themselves with uh, those servers. And not only saying, you know, here's, my, here's the node, but also here's what the services that this node provides. I think for me, one of the kind of biggest shifts in this, in this transition that we're under is that we used to be able to reason about this kind of clean mapping between a switch port, a MAC address and an IP and then that IP you had some semblance of an application or a service. When you talk about containerized workloads, the IPs themselves have become overloaded in terms of I might have 100 containers running behind that single IP, and they don't necessarily have any relation to one another. They may, be, they may require different service policies. They may move around all of the time. Uh, you know, I might go from two instances of my web server to 200 instances of my web server in the course of a day and then scale back down. In this world, the foundational piece of it from a networking standpoint is having a, an understanding of what those services are in the context of the application, not in the context of the network. So we call this the service registry. Show me a real-time directory or a real-time source of truth for what all of the services are that are running in my network and what is their health status. And I can use that source of truth, which is now shared between a network and engineering community and an application developer community to drive things like network automation, right? Those have downstream effects. If you go from two to 200 web servers, I likely need to update firewall rules in conjunction with that scale up. I need to update load balancing rules as a, as a function of that scaling up and down. And then finally in 2020, no networking discussion is, is complete without the notion of a service mesh. So we also enable through console this kind of service mesh approach where we can say now in addition to understanding where all of those services are, as a networking function and a networking platform, I can provide what I like to call secure sockets as a service. 
If you give me two TCP endpoints anywhere in the network, I can guarantee that we can mutually authenticate those two workloads, uh, make sure that it's in line with the intention should they actually communicate with one another, and then, and then finally encrypt all of the traffic in between those endpoints without having to burden my application developers with doing this. So we really are just kind of moving up the stack where layer three was sort of the foundational, uh, you know, kind of traditional networking platform. Now with service mesh, that's moving up into layer four and we're providing a, a curated layer four experience for our application developers and consumers. So a couple of the use cases here that we'll kind of briefly chat about. And I mentioned service registry a couple times. You know, there's a there's the in, in the net DevOps community, there is this huge um, you know, demand for a source of truth. My kind of philosophy on that is that source of truth needs to be, you know, one is I don't know that the industry will get to a single source of truth. And instead, I think we're gonna have like federations of sources of truth and being able to kind of uh, you know derive meaningful insights from the various locations. But more importantly, this is a shared source of truth. It's not just about what's in the network. It's a source of truth about what's running on the network in terms of nodes and services. Uh, console, with that, it's agent architecture. There's some very interesting videos you can read around there around this notion of Vivaldi, which is a decentralized network coordinate system. Through those agents communication, I can derive things like what are the, what's the latency between any two nodes in my network? Where is the closest service? Where is the closest node? Or what's the next closest data center that I may need to fail over a traffic pattern to? Uh, and obviously this has disaster recovery implications and the like of that, uh, but it's a very, very interesting concept of being able to kind of get that data in a more efficient manner without having to like sort of say, I'm gonna have every node in my network ping every other node in my network and somehow do some big data crunching to figure out that information. Uh, the distributed health checking components of networking. So again, as the services register, it's great that that service was there and was uh, you know, functioning yesterday, but the, if the service isn't there and not functioning today, as a network engineer, I need to use this information that's now available to me to you know, engineer the traffic patterns or engineer the routing to these services in the most efficient manners. So, uh, you know, and that again, I've, I've mentioned this a couple times now, but this sort of dynamic firewall rules and load balancer pools. I mean, I think that's one common use case that a lot of folks are struggling with is like sort of, how do I make sure that the server pool behind a VIP and a load balancer is actually accurate and, and, and have a little bit more intelligent, uh, you know, health check that goes along with it than, you know, can I talk to port 80 on the web server? And if I can talk to the port 80, I assume that, that everything's good and I'll send traffic to it. So we're getting a very, very much a more granular view into the health of the services and then using that to feed these automations that we're working on in the terms of firewall rules and load balancers. And, and one of the, the key mechanisms that we do to, to sort of make that happen or glue that together is we're able to take existing scripts and playbooks that you may be developing and actually monitor this service registry for changes to it. As the web server scales, the new instances register themselves with the service registry and I feed that to you know, my downstream scripts and they're given the input of what's the state of that service and all of the healthy instances. And I use that as input to feed you know, workflows that are still IP and port driven. Uh, console template, much like uh, Vault Agent, is, is kind of another mechanism where, where we can use that data set of the service catalog as an input into, you know, how do we render that configuration to a, to, you know, into a format that's usable for maybe an API call into my load balancer or an iOS configuration or an ASA configuration that's, you know, largely you know, CLI based that I may need to actually, you know, templatize that out and, and, and then just use as variables the, the real-time state of those. And I mentioned service mesh, um, you know, secure sockets as a service is the way I think about it. Let me provide a foundation where I can guarantee the, uh, the authentication, authorization and encryption of that communication in flight between any two services in any infrastructure in any cloud, public or private. And a little bit of a shameless plug here, I'll, I'll point out um, 
we do have, I, I've been working, you know, pretty heavily with some of the folks at Cisco. I know there's a lot of Cisco uh, customers on this call. So we actually have a, a, a ACI App Center app coming soon, whereas an ACI operator, I can actually glean some of this information and visibility into the deeper service levels of what those nodes or those endpoints on my network are actually providing and, um, and, and kind of use that uh, to gain additional insight into what I'm talking about. And I think to, to kind of make that more concrete, right? What, what happens in a lot of organizations is the networking team will take a ticket that says, my application isn't uh, you know, behaving well. And then that immediately kicks off this kind of long resolution process where you say, okay, well, where's your application running? Can you give me its IP address? What port is it listening to? Where are you coming from? Uh, um, you know, all of those sort of you know, resolution type problems with this level of visibility, we're giving a deeper level of insight into all of the health checks and nodes and services that console uh, uh, knows about, and then are able to render that and are, you know, enrich the data that's already present in something like ACI. So moving kind of up the stack again here, uh, you know, Nomad. So Nomad is our application automation. This is where we run infrastructure. And I think this one is is sort of in a space that's getting a lot of uh, you know airtime with things like Kubernetes or serverless functions. And and you know when you think about that kind of generational problem that we started out with, I think it's one thing to say like just move all your applications to Kubernetes and life is going to be good. And, and and while Kubernetes does offer a, a you know a great uh, you know series of functions for an application developer. What we find is that there is also, in addition to those kind of container orchestrations and scaling and managing these modern applications, there's also a good deal of customers that kind of want to bridge back to the future, where it's like, that's great, and that's what we need to do moving forward. But I also have these Python scripts or these Go binaries or these Java applications or just VM workloads that I also need to, to schedule and orchestrate um, and it would be really nice if I had one tool that could do kind of the container side of it and the legacy application side of it or a Python script or you know something like that. And then the third use case for Nomad is kind of this batch uh, uh, workload orchestration. And, and again, you know, as a network engineer, I think we can you know, kind of get our heads around this one where it's like, hey, every night at midnight, I have this Python script that's gonna go out and, and collect all of the, the you know, running configs from my devices. And that's great if you want to write a Python script to iterate across the 100,000 devices and get all of that. But we can think about this now in more of a microservices approach where it's, hey, if I can get a Python script or an Ansible playbook that you know, backs up that configuration for one device and then parallelize it by you know, putting it into an orchestration system and say, so I'm just going to run 100,000 instances of that now. And each instance is responsible for collecting one job or you know one configuration then my job as the developer of that uh you know application or script to, to tackle that use case ends up becoming remarkably simple to do and we can really give kind of a production hardening uh you know spin on the the, the sort of artisanal python scripts that a lot of folks are, are developing so how does this apply to the networking? And again, this is where, you know, if we go back to the framing of the conversation, a lot of net DevOps engineers are in fact network, you know, application developers now. And one of the things that I had a lot of conversations with is as we help them, you know, develop that Python script, like, okay, now how do I run this in production? So Nomad, when you think of Nomad, just think of it as a dead simpler, dead simple task scheduler for your automation scripts. And I kind of view it as this sort of modern replacement for, you know, what used to be the tool server, where instead of it just being one monolithic server where we pile a bunch of, you know, scripts and things like that, now we can kind of have our own platform for how we, uh, uh, you know, run those tools without having to, you know, sort of see if the Kubernetes team will allow us to launch some pods on there uh, and just have a much simpler way of, of kind of running those automations. And the good thing is, is should you use that in the terms, in terms of the, hash, the overall Hashi stack, whatever you're running in that Nomad scheduler is going to have very, very ready, readily at, 
accessible information that comes from console for getting the service registry data, feeding it into my scripts for things like inventories or you know the IPs or, or ports of where something's running, and then also vault integration so that I don't have to hard code those credentials directly into my playbook. Instead, I can just assume that when they're running on top of Nomad, I can easily access those uh, in a dynamic fashion. So we covered a lot there. And Hank, I want you to note that it's 1040. You told me to go 30 to 40 minutes. And I went exactly 40 minutes. I put some resources in. These slides are going to be made available to uh, you know the, the audience immediately after. Uh, the learning tracks is where it starts. I, again, we covered a lot of information. Um, you know, If you're interested in any of this and want to get started, learn.hashicorp.com is where it's at to, to kind of get the overall foundation. We also have Instruct as a platform, which has you know, self-paced lab, interactive lab environments, similar to kind of what the DevNet sandboxes do. And then I put a couple links in here to the documentation for all of the tools, as well as when you get the slide decks, there is a, a, a series of kind of curated slides that I threw in there for everybody around how uh, you, know, you might use these use cases in reality, a little bit more meat behind the bone there. With that, Hank, I'll, I'll throw it back to you for some uh, what I, I expect to be some lively questions and answers. Hey, hey, Kevin, thanks so much. That was a great breakdown and kind of overview of the different tools that are in the Hashi model um, and gave us kind of a way to, to look at how they fit together. Um, I was able to put together a bunch of questions here from your presentation um, that I came up with as well as a few from the audience. So let's, let's talk through some of these. The first one I want is so HashiCorp has been obviously very popular with application developers cloud in the cloud world um, everybody knows them in that space why why does HashiCorp care about networking people and network infrastructure like where where's the relevance why were they recruiting folks like yourself yeah I think it starts with the high level high level premise that like we're, we're out here to accelerate application delivery and and when you you know that's a kind of tossed around pretty lightly these days, but it sort of takes a village, right? I mean, it's not just go put everything in Kubernetes and life is gonna be good. Like these things have to run on top of networks that are gonna connect multiple Kubernetes pods, connect those Kubernetes pods to, you know, VMs that are on-prem, VMs that are in the cloud. And so again, you know, we, we think about the workflow that goes into all of that and not necessarily like, what is the underlying technology? The network technology isn't is important. It's there, but how do we make sure that we're provisioning it efficiently with the application in mind and the things that are running on the network as opposed to just what's in the network? Mm -hmm. No, that makes that makes sense. And I think as and we've seen this in other places, as more and more of the application folks are having to deal with with outside of just a single cloud world and connect things together, um, the network is becoming important, as is security, as is the larger systems and private data centers and all of those. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time diving into the, the Vault piece, because this is an area, Vault's a tool that we use inside of our environment in DevNet Sandbox to manage our secrets. Um, and I was thinking through, through it more as you were going through the piece. So let's say, let's say that I have my Python script that's going to connect off to my network devices that are out there. You, you've mentioned inside of Vault when you're in like the cloud world, you're going to authenticate based on all sorts of metadata and attributes that are out there to, to prove that your client has access to the credentials you're after. How is my Python script, like what am I going to use to authenticate in that case? Like how do I prove I have rights to get access to these credentials that are there when I'm not coming from a another tool or an integrated part of a stack. I'm just coming from a Python script that I'm writing. Yeah, and so in the Python script for starters, like we have the ability to, uh, uh, you know, have an API driven workflow for Vault. So everything that, that Vault does is, is starts and ends with that API. So you can interact with that with common libraries like requests and things like that. I think the, the, the crux of your question though was more about the identity method. And certainly if you're in Kubernetes and we can authenticate that you're you know, in fact running on a trusted Kubernetes or tr on some sort of trusted platform, and I, th I definitely think it's easier there. Uh, so when you're, when you're not in those environments though, we do offer some additional uh, kind of identity methods that, that you may actually have access to, right? I, I, I may not be running on Kubernetes, but I do have access to an on-prem LDAP system. And if the user that's executing that script 
is, can be authenticated to that LDAP or Active Directory system, then that in turn uh, gives them the identity uh, that they need. We also have patterns through what we call like an app role identity method, where we can kind of combine two different pieces of information, like one that you know and one that's going to be injected at runtime. So you might bake an image with something like Packer that has an app role in it that says, here's the function that this VM is going to ultimately run once it's instantiated on any infrastructure. And then at runtime, what I'm doing is I'm injecting in the other piece of information. And the goal here is just to make sure that those two pieces of identifying information, the app role and the app role secret, aren't stored together in the same Python script that's going to be sort of tossed about randomly in all of these various cloud environments. Okay, and that, that makes sense um, on those pieces. One of the other things that, that kind of struck me as you were going through it is in the cloud space, there's that concept of like short-lived credentials. Um, and that makes a ton of sense. And I was trying to figure out how could, could we do something like that in the network? So I, I had this vision of a, a world where rather than having kind of the traditional network authentication model, maybe through TACX or a, a integration with Radius or something, but, but Vault goes out and creates a user account and password when, when it's asked for them. So my script needs access to the network. I ask Vault for credentials. Vault goes and creates a credential on the device, maybe in TACX or someplace, and then at some point in time goes and rips it out. Um, is that the kind of thing that you think may start happening kind of as we modernize the way that we manage credentials in the network space? Yeah, absolutely. We, with all of our tools, we sort of try to take this crawl, walk, run approach to it. And, and you know, I think when it comes to whether it's a username and password, a, a TLS certificate, an SSH key, there's sort of these opposing forces where we leave those things very long lived because it's hard to rotate them. We have to touch a bunch of different systems and we have to do so in a coordinated fashion to make sure the rollover of that key happens in a graceful manner. So for us, it starts with getting the workflow down to centralize the secrets into Vault, programmatically access them on demand, you know, even if they're sort of longer lived credentials that happen to be living in Vault. Once you have that workflow down, the actual data, the certificate, the secret itself starts to matter a lot less. And you can use that as the sort of inflection point where you can say, now I can rotate that certificate every day or every two days instead of what we see today. It's sort of like the, the running joke is like you, you, you provision a certificate that has a lifetime that's a couple years longer than you plan on being at your job because you never want to actually rotate that credential. Yeah, that, that sounds familiar. I may, I may have done that myself here fairly recently with some stuff. So so on that, two more, and I, and I want to talk about some of these other pieces. I don't want to spend our entire Q&A just on Vault. So, so you mentioned Vault and PKI, which I think is important. Vault can store certificate data, but can, is Vault ACA? Can it act as like your signed CA for an enterprise? Yeah, it can be either a root CA or an intermediate CA. So what, what, what a common pattern is there is we might see an organization uh, issue a intermediate certificate from their kind of traditional CA infrastructure, but that, that may not have that sort of dynamic nature to it where it's API driven and I can request certificates on demand. Uh, but but because the, tr the, the, the trust chain is, is established through the intermediate CA, Vault can issue those dynamic uh, certificates and they're trusted and we get browser recognition and all of that. An easy way to think about it is sort of being able to ena enable organizations to kind of have an internal shared service that resembles something like a Let's Encrypt that you might find on the, on the public internet. That makes sense. And I didn't know that feature. That's something we'll have to look at because we're trying to figure out how to do our own internal CA stuff in Sandbox and we've been looking at pieces and we've got Vault deployed, so we got to figure out how to connect them. Um, and then on the rotation for accounts for things like routers and firewalls and load balancers, have you seen or has anybody worked on plugins or tools that, that will use Vault to dynamically do that rotation for us? Or just because I can rotate them quickly because they're stored in Vault, is it still up to me to go rotate them though? It could be, and there's various degrees. I have seen a number of community projects and so, it's probably worth noting, and I, I don't know that I called it out explicitly, we, we sort of break it down into the identity side and then the secrets engine side of Vault, right?
right? What what is the you know secrets engines for a MySQL database or secrets engine for AWS spreads? And I have seen some uh, you know it, some implementations and community things around getting like a a Cisco router secrets engine or, or something like that. But but even in the absence of all of that, let's back up to a lot of organizations already have a tool or a process or a script in place to handle the rotation of it. All we're doing with Vault is feeding that as a source of truth for what should the credential be. And, and with things like Vault Agent, then we can also supervise that, that secret in the Vault API. And anytime that would change, then we fire off automatically those downstream automations to handle the rotation uh, for us, whether that's in real time or sort of near real time, or you know maybe even a little bit more asynchronous in just kind of a traditional workflow. The, the key is is that once you get there, how, how many times you do it doesn't really matter. So let's change gears a little bit and talk more talk about console. So. Console is a, does a lot, right? It feels, every time we talk about it, it feels like it's this overwhelming tool that's in place and it, and it has all of these pieces that are there. So I wanna hone in on a couple just like specific questions that I've got here. So the concept of, of the health checks and the service, I think registry was the word that was there. Um, you, you made a lot of analogies off to traditional load balancers or how it fits into the load balancer workflow. Can console replace like a traditional load balancer piece? Like if it knows what's connected to a service, can you just point at console and have it handle the actual load balancing and reverse proxy work use for you? Uh, the, the reverse proxy, maybe not so much. Instead, we rely on kind of ecosystem partners like, uh, you know, an Nginx or an HA proxy for kind of the like reverse proxy use cases, or even in a scenario like with, uh, you know, some of our integrations with F5, like, the data plane itself is, is again, a kind of an underlying technology for us. Customers make choices around those, uh, uh, you know, underlying technologies, and we don't really have an opinion one way or another about which one you should be using. Instead, we think about console as the control plane for that, where in some cases it may make sense in a traditional like service discovery to say, hey, I need an API, you know, service, and through like console's DNS interface, we might just be able to, you know, hook into that and say, you know, tell me where the API is and DNS returns an IP address and maybe some SRV location around a port that I need to connect to. And we can get some basic round robining off of that. But I think a lot of folks on this audience would appreciate that DNS round robining that sometimes isn't the best like load balancing scheme to have. So when you need more advanced layer four through seven capabilities, we would either integrate with HA proxy, F5, so on and so forth, and then use that network automation to be able to feed the real-time service registry with health checks and feed the downstream automations about how the, those devices should be configured. Okay. Not a lot different than when we get into the service mesh, where when you think about a service mesh and some of these emerging like sidecar patterns where we have this you know, Envoy proxy or an Nginx proxy that sits alongside of ours, it's actually console in the background that's pushing in the TLS certificates into that configuration, understanding what the upstreams are that need to be configured for that in terms of the IP address and port information that needs to be fed into that load balancer or proxy, uh, and then handling kind of the, the, you know, the management plane or control plane of it, if you will. Sure, and that makes sense. And I think that that, that helps clarify a bit of those is it's, it's not like console is going to replace some of the work pieces that are there. The work we have to do is how do we pull them together so that the data and the, the configuration of those load balancers are driven in this dynamic fashion. Here's another one. That, I think for that, me, that, that just to double click on that one, one second, Hank, I, I think for me, the, the sort of realization around console was that, you know, in a traditional network kind of engineering mindset, I think there's a tendency to think about things in terms of layer one through three. We understand the physical world, we understand the data link world, we understand the networking layer, and we provide IP addresses as a service to our down, to downstream, and we route those IP services. And again, that was fine when the IP was the thing, right? But now it's services, and the IP address is overloaded and something that we don't control as well in like maybe a public cloud or a highly dynamic environment. Yeah, no, and that makes sense. The health check piece for, for console, I remember back, and I think it was one of the last Cisco Lives we were at, 
you had one of the demos that you wrote was like a console dashboard that showed network devices and if they were up and functioning. It was it was a way you used to make sure that the demos worked. But I'm trying to figure out like does that health check capability could it could it replace something like a Nagios or a SolarWinds panel that's doing like, is my network up? Are things functioning? Is that a use case where console might fit in um, for those types of pieces? Not necessarily that those tools aren't adding other value, but is that the type of thing that the health check gives you? Is, is, is my network up and working? Yeah, and I think the, the way I think about this is, you know, the tr sort of traditional network management is I'm going to have some system, call it Nagios, call it whatever, and it's this like centralized server, and it's going to go out and run these checks periodically, right? But we with those systems, we kind of have two inherent problems. One is the scalability of the system. When I'm, when I'm monitoring tens of thousands of nodes, my poll time might have to go up to five or ten minutes to poll those services across hundreds of thousands of devices. And secondarily, it's sort of pretty core trained. Like I can ping it or I can connect to a TCP port. The distributed health checks and console push some of that monitoring back to where the application lives. And we can do things like incorporate, like what's the memory utilization on the server that this service is running? Can it reach the downstream you know, database or API layers that go along with it? And then provide a, a better, more trusted view of is this service healthy that spans across the, the network domain and the application domain? Well, and that makes sense for the applications where you can load an agent on, but I'm, I'm picturing, so I, I've got a, an environment with, with hundreds of firewalls because every one of our pods has a firewall in front of it. Could I, could I use console to make sure that those are up and that, they're, that any connect is working successfully, that like at the device is SSH, that it can reach the internet, like the checks that I wanna do. Is, because in this case, like, like I don't have, it's not an application piece. My service isn't like a web browser. It's, it's these other things. Like, is there a way to fit that into that world? Yeah, I think the application's always an eye of the beholder, right? For, for a network engineer, the network is the application. That's what we, that's what we're paid to do, right? And so, yeah, we have tools, you know, that kind of fit into the console ecosystem. One that I'm a big fan of is something called the console external services manager which is I can't necessarily run an agent on there, but I want to kind of bridge the gap between the traditional centralized approach of being able to probe and things like that and get those health checks, but then also on the back end incorporate them into the overall consolidated real-time source of truth. So like you mentioned the one of the demos that, that I ran in, in at Cisco, yeah, and that was a great use case for console, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when we thought about configuration management and infrastructure as code, it was all great when you had the static inventory of nodes that were the production environment. But as the sort of we started thinking about like, how do we spin up a replica of the production network using something like a Cisco viral? Now, all of a sudden, I have these nodes that pop up and I want to know, are they ready? And, and where are they? At? Like, what IPs did they get when they got assigned so that I can then feed that into you know, whatever else I was going to do from a network automation or configuration management standpoint. Okay. I'll have to look at that a little bit more because there's some interesting use cases there that I like. Um, we are f quickly running out of time and I'm looking at the questions that I've got here. And there, there was one I definitely wanted to get the answer to. And, and you didn't dive into these tools specifically a whole lot in the presentation. But I know as a network automation engineer, they, they pop up. And so can you help? You talked about Terraform a bit. But there's also these other tools from Hashi, Vagrant, and Packer. And they all seem to, at their heart of it, like spin up some resource someplace and tear it down. Um, and I know there's places where I use Vagrant fairly regularly. There's places we use Terraform regularly. There's places we use Packer. But, but I don't know if I'm using them in the right spots and where it goes in. So as an, an engineer just getting started with infrastructure as code, how do I figure out which of those tools makes the most sense in a use case? Well, I think they solved a couple fundamental different problems, right? So, and, and poor Packer and, and Vagrant, they, they don't get a lot of love because they've been around for so long and we just sort of assume that everybody knows what they are, which is a great question. Again, tying this back to that overall application lifecycle, whatever that application may be, whether it's a, you know, a network device or whether it's a you know, mobile application or whatever, the first thing that we need to do to increase developer agility is give them access to something re resembling the production environment in a way that's very low friction. I would run 
my application on my local laptop using things like VirtualBox or, or VMware and, and sort of that being the hypervisor. So we very much think about Vagrant as being able to provide that dev local environment. I don't have any other dependencies. I don't have to file any tickets. I can take a VM image, add packages to it, add my application code, add my Python scripts to it, test out it to a trial configuration on a virtualized you know, networking device, those sort of things. After I've built that image of what that VM is locally on my machine, I now have to take that from development and put it into production. And so Packer is the mechanism by which we take a VM image and, or, and, and this is an infrastructure as code approach. So we say, you start with a basic Ubuntu machine, you add these packages, you drop this application code or this script into it. And then you have now this immutable image that I'm gonna want to deploy on some number of, of target environments. And so Packer is responsible for taking the machine definition, the image definition, in the same way you think about like a Docker file for composing a container image, Packer is responsible for containing, creating those same sort of immutable images. And then we move through the life cycle, say now great, I've got this VM image and I've got maybe different copies of it, one that can be deployed in VMware, one that can be deployed in AWS, and one that can be deployed in, in Azure. And now I need to actually take that image and instantiate it in the real world. And that's where we start to talk about Terraform for that infrastructure provision. Okay, and that, I think that breakdown makes a ton of sense. All right, last question, and I think this one will be a short one. So you're out there talking about the HashiCorp um, tools and ecosystems and helping customers solve problems. Who, which teams and the customers are you talking to? Are you talking to network engineers and operators? Are you talking to cloud people? I, I see your smile. I, I think I kind of know the answer, but let's say I'm a network engineer and I want to be involved and help some of these pieces. Any recommendations to, to those folks? Yeah, so we, I mean, depending upon the product or in a lot of cases, even within one product, we do end up talking to a lot of different, uh, you know, kind of uh, personas, right? And, and I think, you know, it's sort of hard to kind of put a persona around an engineer of any discipline these days, right? Our, our, our job descriptions are rapidly changing in this multi-cloud world. So, you know, again, when we think about it in terms of the layers, right, there's somebody in the organization that's responsible for infrastructure provisioning. And, and that sort of is more broad based in, in the cloud environments, but kind of, you know, we're trying to take that same operational model and push it in, you know, more pervasively across public cloud and on-prem. Vault is obviously generally led by kind of a security persona. Uh, and then console, you know, again, it's being the Swiss army knife that it is, right? I think there's kind of two personas that we talk about there. One is, the kind of modern application developer that says, hey, I need a service mesh that with mutual TLS uh, authentication and encryption. And then the other persona that we talked there is very much a networking persona where it says, hey, I have to automate these firewalls. I have to automate these load balancers. And in order to do that, I have to have a reliable source of information about where these other things are running, again, on top of my network, as opposed to like, hey, I've got IP addresses on interfaces in a, in a network, and that's great, I need to manage those, and I need to care about them greatly, but I, just so much as that, I also need to care about what the IP addresses and ports are for the things that are providing the services, and that's an invaluable piece of information to me and that sort of source of truth uh, search that I think a lot of Net DevOps engineers are on. Awesome. All right, well, thank you so much for joining me today, Kevin. This was a, a wonderful discussion, kind of helped a lot of pieces and I think we could probably do an entire net DevOps live season just dedicated on the hashy tools unfortunately I don't know if I'll get that opportunity but I'll keep bringing you back as often as you're willing to go through on that so any final words for the audience no Hank thanks for having me back it's been a little bit of a homecoming here to the net DevOps uh, interested to see the attendees I'm sure I've got some uh, some familiar faces out there watching my ugly mug right now all right, thank you again for all joining us today for our discussion. And so if you're looking for the resources for this episode, you'll find them on the webinar resources section under Net DevOps Live for today's episode. You'll find docs and links to the documentation of all the tools that Kevin talked about, links to those learning lab resources that are there. And of course, if you're looking for a sandbox to try out, we've got some suggestions that are in that spot as well. Now, please always take a chance to, to put some code where, uh, where the, the knowledge comes from. 
And in this case, let's look at that Terraform piece. We've got the, the, um, the ACI always on Sandbox. We've got webinars and resources out there for tying Terraform into your ACI policies. So let's see if you can go ahead and create an infrastructure as code ACI application um, profile, <coughs> profile for something like that traditional web app data three tier. It's a great example use case and, and trying to try out some of these different technologies and infrastructures code. And bonus points if you bring in other tools from the HashiCorp ecosystem like Vault to manage some of the credentials that are out there. Now, if you're looking for more, more information on NetDevOps, check out the NetDevOps pages up on DevNet, developer.cisco.com slash NetDevOps or slash live will show you all of the previous season's episodes, as well as let you register for the future upcoming episodes that are scheduled and have yet to be recorded. And then if you're looking to get started, you're in those early phases, I always like to send people off to the Network Programmability Basics video course to introduce you to all of kind of the fundamental topics necessary as you drive into these, these areas. And we are not done in season three yet. Next week, we have uh, another Kevin, Kevin Schweiber from Postman will join me to talk about how we can give our network a rest by using Postman to tackle all of those wonderful REST APIs that we're seeing pop up across our platforms. So please register and join us next week for that episode. And then as always, if you have any more questions, please reach out and stay in touch. You can find me at hapresto at cisco.com in WebEx Teams or email or hfpreston on Twitter. And be sure to follow Cisco DevNet on all the social medias. With that, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of NetDevOps Live, and we will catch you next time. Thank you.